Well, we're going to look today at the topic of how to hear prophecy. And uh, I'm uh, excited by that. Uh, I also in fear and trembling uh, as I speak about this. Uh, it's something that I've spent a lot of time exploring, uh, like about 40 years, and in particular over the last week or so, uh, going back and thinking into the passages of Scripture and thinking how that, how that applies to what we are doing and what we see going on around about us. Uh, my hope as we look at this together is that it will build unity amongst us because God's spirit is a spirit of unity and a spirit of truth. And so as we uh, explore his word together, I think we can have confidence in that, but it will take some work in grappling with what the scriptures are saying. And so tonight, perhaps more so than typically, we've got a, got a very small passage uh, that I'm preaching on, but there'll be a whole heap of extra references uh, that I will either read out or draw your attention to so that we can both see the bigger picture and put things back into context. Uh, so let's, uh, let's have a little bit of a think about it. Um, it. It might be that as you thought about this topic, you were excited as well about the prospect of exploring it. It might be that you had a certain amount of worry. I mean, what's Dave going to say? Uh, will I like it? Uh, how will that go? What will happen at church afterwards? Um, I think as I think back over my uh, years of being a Christian, there have been a few times when people have uh, come to me with a particular word of prophecy. Uh, they've said that they think that God is telling them something for me or something for the church that I've been involved in or even leading. And these have been times that have meant that we've had to explore some really kind of significant issues and some fraught issues relationally as to how to go about that. Uh, when I was a teenager, there was one church in the city that I lived in that gained a reputation for its special focus on what they called their spiritual gifts. So what tended to happen in that city was that the teenagers from every youth group stopped going to their own youth group all went to that youth group and to that ministry because there, there were exciting things that were happening. There were people who were being healed. There were people who were hearing special words of knowledge. There were people who were being, and it was called slain in the spirit, like going up the front and being touched and then they would collapse. And there were all sorts of things. And I remember being in the ISCF group uh, in year 12 when this was going on. And people would come back with remarkable stories. And there were a few times, I think, where I had the experience of FOMO, just fear of missing out. I don't want to miss what's happening. If God's doing something, I want to be a part of it. And there was a lot of peer pressure associated with that as well. Some of you may have been involved in sharing prophecy with others. Some of you may have received prophecy. Some of you may be unsure whether you have a message and communicated and not quite knowing how to go about it. Some of you may have received a message from others and not been quite sure what to do about it. It can be a, a, a tangle. There can be confusion as we think about this. And we know, don't we, that there are those who've abused the idea of having a message from God. Uh, last night, I was watching the SBS documentary with Mark Fennell called The Kingdom. Um, some of you have probably seen that. There have been a number of similar documentaries going on in recent times. But I thought that one was a particularly interesting documentary because it, there were warmth and recognition of God being at work, but there was also an acknowledgement that there were things that were wrong and disturbing and that had left a whole trail of damage. And I think that probably as we consider what goes on in churches, particularly when people claim to have a word of prophecy and they give that prophecy and people need to respond to that prophecy, there have been circumstances where people have been abused, spiritually abused, where power has been used in an unhelpful way. Of course, churches have also been through divisions on this issue, 
And I do and have been praying that salt will not. And I think one of the complex issues for us here is that many of you have a breadth of Christian relationships outside of our church, uh, especially through Christian schooling, where you'll have friends who are teachers in other uh, churches, uh, families, parents and kids, mixing from a whole range of different fellowships and churches and backgrounds. And as we get together with people from different denominations, from different individual churches, uh, there are a range of perspectives on these things. Uh, if you're exploring this theologically, there are some key issues that come up in what you might call the evangelical camp as opposed to the Pentecostal camp. Uh, there are those who would call themselves continuists, that is speaking about the spiritual gifts of the New Testament continuing today. And there are others who would call themselves cessationists, saying that the spiritual gifts of the New Testament were there for the time of Jesus and the apostles, but they don't continue today in the same way. Um, why are these things important? Of course, there's a lot to grapple with here, isn't there? And I, I just wanted to paint uh, a little bit of the complexity of it and some of the relational complexity as we begin looking at it together. Well, let's read it again. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Um, you've got, again, like we had last week, these kind of punchy short commands. Uh, but the order in the original language is actually even more punchy. I'll kind of give you a, a more literal version. The spirit, do not quench. Prophecies, do not treat with contempt. All these things, test them. The good, hold on to it. The evil, reject every kind of it. That's the original word order in the Greek. It's punchy, isn't it? And, and there's a focus to that. And it might be that he was running out of room on his scroll and just had to kind of punch out a couple of little points. And if that is the case, or for whatever reason, we don't have a lot of information here, I think it's important for us to have a look at the wide angle of what the Bible says about prophecy before we come back to the more narrow angle of how we might put this into practice in what we see amongst the Thessalonians. So we're going to do a quick tour of what the Bible has to say about prophecy. Again, it won't be everything, but I, I hope it might be representative. So the first thing uh, is a reference that's not actually there on your outline. So if you're taking notes, and you might want to, because you might want to uh, come back to some of these things, uh, it's in Exodus chapter 7. Exodus uh, chapter 7. And it's a very helpful little definitional statement about prophecy. Um, while you're looking that up, or don't worry if you're not fast at getting around the Bible and you can't juggle too many bits of paper because I've given you most of the references. Um, but while you're doing that, I will take questions after this. Um, so if there are questions that you've got as we go along, hang on to them um, and you might want to ask them. If you don't feel like asking a question publicly, text the question to my mobile phone. Um, and my mobile phone is on the back of your handout under Dave McDonald. All right, so let me just read you quickly from Exodus, uh, and it's chapter 7 and verse 1. Moses has been complaining that he, he doesn't speak real good, and then the Lord says to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother, brother Aaron is to tell the Pharaoh, to Pharaoh to let the Israelites go uh, out of his country. Now, the, the key thing just to notice there is that God is going to give a message to Moses and Moses will pass it on to Aaron to speak to the people. And he says that, Moses, you're going to be like God. Aaron, he's going to be like the prophet. So that tells us, I think, something really key. That is that prophecy is a message to be passed on uh, from God through another. Uh, it's not just something that you receive to keep for yourself. 
It's not just a, a, a word of understanding uh, or an insight. It's something to be communicated, to be prophesied. And here we see the background that it's the idea of God's message through a human being. Now, probably the key passage in the Old Testament on prophecy is in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And I'll, I'll read a little bit of this, and I'll need my glasses. In verse 15, the, the, sorry, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses, from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of God any more, or see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the fellow Israelites, and I'll put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything that I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything that I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is, the message, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. Now, there's so much information in there. I'll just kind of point to some quick things. First of all, here is the promise of a great prophet who is to come. And the New Testament tells us that that is Jesus. He is the one who reveals God and speaks that truth to all. Uh, we also see that the nature of the prophet is that he will always speak the truth. Otherwise, he is a false prophet and comes under judgment. Um, if he says something and it doesn't come true, then he's clearly a false prophet. And it may be that he's presuming to say something that God hasn't actually said to him, so caution around that one because the penalty is death. And you're certainly not allowed to speak on behalf of other gods, like the gods of Baal and Elijah, for example. So prophecy is a big deal. It's a really big deal in, in the Old Testament here. And God in the law, in Deuteronomy, establishes guidelines for receiving of prophecy. Now, as you go on through the Old Testament, um, you will meet prophecy again and again and again and again. And you'll get to a section of the Old Testament that gets described as the books of prophecy. And some of them are big, like Jeremiah. Some of them are small, like Haggai. Um, let me give you a little taste of the sort of thing that you hear from the Old Testament about the prophets. This is from the beginning of Jeremiah. Uh, in Jeremiah 1, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I anointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young. You must go to everyone that I send you to and say whatever I command you. So do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. And then the Lord reached out his hand and he touched my mouth and he said to me, I have put words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, again and again in Jeremiah and many of the other prophets, you'll hear them saying consciously, this is what the Lord says. They know that they've received a message from God God gives the message to them and it's their responsibility to pass it on faithfully. They don't have to make it up. They don't have to interpret it. They pass it on. And the New Testament tells us that sometimes the things they prophesied about, they didn't even understand. They longed to look into these things. Even angels longed to look into these things that they didn't understand. Was it a good gig to get being a prophet? Well, read Jeremiah and then see what you think. Um, I'm glad that my name's David and not Jeremiah. Um, it, it's a serious thing to have the responsibility of communicating God's word to the people. And you'll notice here something really important, and that is, see today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms. So the prophet, because he's the mouthpiece of God, has authority over the king. 
He has authority over the empire, the emperor. God speaks through Nathan and King David needs to repent. That's the way prophecy works. Now, there's a lot more examples in the Old Testament, but I want to move now out of the Old Testament and into the New Testament and uh, see what the New Testament says about the Old Testament. And uh, I'm going to read just quickly from 2 Peter. It's on your outline. Chapter 1 and verse 19 and following. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Um, Now, it's the next two verses that I want to focus on for now. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit enabled the prophet to speak the truth from God. And all scripture, it says here, is prophetic because it is all God's word from the Spirit through the writers of scripture that we receive and need to follow because God is speaking to us through this prophetic word of scripture. Um, Likewise, in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, Uh, you get this introduction to a wonderful book. We we must do Hebrews together here at Salt sometime soon. Um, In uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So in the introduction here to Hebrews, you get God speaking formally in the Old Testament in all kinds of different ways to the prophets who have written down what we have in Scripture. And in the last days, he has spoken definitively in his son Jesus And we know it's definitive because he is the exact representation of God's being. So everything you want to know about God is in fullness in Christ. All right, so that's that's an important kind of framework. Prophecy and scripture, we see that, that basically all scripture is prophecy. But does that mean that all prophecy is scripture? Well, no. Um... Now, when you get to the New Testament, one of the puzzles, and I'm going to present you with a few puzzles that I'm not going to be solving uh, tonight, but one of the puzzles is to work out, is there a categorical distinction between Old Testament and New Testament prophecy? Um, it's, it's a, I've got my thoughts on it and so on, but it, it's a puzzle that you need to think about. You can't just make assumptions one way or the other. Um, you need to look at the evidence and make a decision. So I'll I'll give you a little taste of this. In in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, we see this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So the church of Jesus Christ is built on the foundation of, of the prophets and the apostles, except it doesn't say that. It says that it's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, is this the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles? I don't think so. I think it's actually talking about two New Testament groups, that is, the prophets and the apostles, because he mentions the apostles first, that's one indicator, And secondly, um, it's the cornerstone of the church. But it's really verses later in the letter that lead me to thinking he's talking about New Testament prophets. And so in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, we read, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, 
the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built. So if it's built on the foundation, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Jesus gives the apostles, prophets, and the evangelists and the pastors and teachers, then it's a good indication, I think, that he's talking about a New Testament category here of the prophets. How are you going? Yeah. Still on board, right? Working hard, that's good. I should have said, have a double strength coffee before you come to Sabo. Um, I did. Uh, now, other evidence of the importance of prophecy in the New Testament comes in that simple little book at the end called Revelation. Um, by the way, there's only one Revelation. Uh, as I grew up, I used to call it Revelations, and I find people still calling it Revelations today, but there's only one. Uh, don't call it Revelations. Call it Revelation or the Apocalypse. Or... Okay, so um, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So what is the book of Revelation? It's a, it's a book of prophecy or a letter of prophecy. That's what it is. What is at the heart of prophecy in Revelation? Well, I'll give you an insight into this from chapter 19. Chapter 19 of Revelation and verse 10. We read this, Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. So there's two things there that we see in Revelation, just quickly. There's a lot more, by the way. But two things that are important in understanding prophecy in the New Testament. One is that this book of Revelation is prophecy. Is that just because it's telling the future? No. A lot of Revelation has to do with the past as well as the future. But the heart of it is that its spirit bears testimony to Jesus. The nature of God's prophecy is to bear testimony to Jesus. And of course, you've got Jesus as the centerpiece of this book, wholeheartedly. Now, yes, prophecy is important then. The foundation of the church, um, the key message of Jesus. But we also see Jesus warning about prophecy and prophets. So we worked our way through the book of Matthew over the last couple of years. And we, if you can remember back to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has this to say. Matthew 7, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. What does that mean? It means they won't be obvious. They, they won't come saying, by the way, I'm a heretic um, and I'm going to be preaching today. Isn't that good? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't come like that. But how do you know? Well, he says this, by your fruit, by their fruit, you will recognise them. Um, every good fruit, every good tree bears good fruit. Every bad tree bears bad fruit and so on. By their fruit, you will recognise them. So we've got a picture here of, of Jesus warning that there will be people who are false prophets. They're called prophets but they're not godly prophets. They're not proclaiming God's message. They're not proclaiming the testimony of Jesus. They're proclaiming other messages. And you need to watch out for them. How do you know? Well, look at their lives. That'll be a good indicator. But it's not the only indicator. So in, in 1 John chapter 4, uh, John writes also talking about the impact of potential false prophets. And in chapter 4, verse 1, dear friends, he says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognise the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. So how do you recognise the false prophet? Well, they don't point to Jesus. They don't recognise that Jesus has come from God in the flesh, as it says here. Uh, and then a couple more references. Um, 
you can see uh, this one on your handout, so at the bottom of the page, 2 Peter chapter 1, chapter 2, sorry, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. So he's, he's pointing back to the Old Testament, to the past. There were false prophets and there will be false teachers. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. So there are a number of warnings in the New Testament about uh, being careful not to be deceived by false prophets. And one of the tests is to have a look at the character of their lives. Have a look at their fruit. Um, bad fruit comes from a bad tree. All right, and, um, and then finally, um, in this background, wide-angle stuff, probably one of the most significant chapters, or groups of chapters, if you like, in the New Testament about prophecy, is in 1 Corinthians 12 through to 14, particularly in chapter 14. So just a, a, a quick intro to that. Uh, chapter 12 is talking about spiritual things, gets into talking about gifts. Chapter 13, remember the wedding passage, love is, it's not about weddings. It's actually about gifts and the way that gifts are to be used. They're to be used in a way that's loving. What is loving? Loving is what builds the church. And then in chapter 14, the heart of it is a contrast between two gifts that are obviously on view there in Corinth, the gift of speaking in tongues and the gift of prophecy. And he contrasts and I think kind of flips their attitude to the gifts and says that the most valuable thing is what will build. So seek what will build when you think about spiritual things. So I'll just give you a couple of references there in verse 3. Um, bear in mind, all of, all of this section, chapter 14, is comparing tongues and prophecy by and large. He says, But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging and comfort. That's the purpose of the prophecy, that, that the church will be built and people will be encouraged and they'll persevere as believers. But look at this. A little further down, two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to one who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged because the spirits of prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Now, this raises something which is at least intriguing. And that is that there might be a number of people in the gathering who have a word of prophecy and one might come to somebody and it's the right thing for somebody who is prophesying to stop and then perhaps for another to start, but it's important that it's weighed up, evaluated, tested, assessed. How does that relate to prophecy if it's the word of God? Well, we'll come back to that. So... All right, all that's kind of the wide angle. There's, there's a bit going on there. So let's try and zoom in now on 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, and we're going to go a little bit faster uh, through this. By the way, if you're at church with us at Salt uh, this afternoon for the first time, welcome. It's great to have you with us. And uh, this, is, this is the start of the new regime. We're going to be working really, really hard every week from now on. Is that right? No, we should. We should. Bring it on. Okay. All right. So prophecy among the Thessalonians. Paul says, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Now that raises the question, why might they be tempted to do that? Why might they be tempted to treat prophecies with contempt? Are there any indicators in Thessalonians of why they might be tempted to do this? Now, I ask that question because I think that's the question to ask. You want to look at context first. Um, 
And is there anything in the context? Well, not so much in 1 Thessalonians, but there is in 2. And so if you have a look there at your handouts uh, from verse 1, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Now, that's an issue that he's raised already about what happens about the day of the Lord. Will some people miss out because they've died already? And how do we know when Christ is going to come? If he's talking about these things, it's at least reasonable to reconstruct the fact that maybe some people had been declaring that this is what God is doing when in fact he isn't. And so Paul's saying to them, don't quench the spirit, don't despise prophecy. In other words, don't just dismiss what people are saying out of hand. Instead, instead test them and hold on to the good and get rid of the evil. Now, I think in Thessalonians, that's probably uh, in line with what has given rise to Paul saying this. But where do you go with this? Well, I think the key thing is pretty simple. I believe that treating prophecies with contempt is to be taken as an example of quenching the spirit. Uh, Not the only way to quench the spirit. How can you quench the spirit? Well, it's a metaphor, all right? You you can't actually pour water on the spirit and get rid of the spirit. Uh, The metaphor of flame, you might remember Jesus saying, um, sorry, John the Baptist saying that when Jesus comes, he will baptise with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then the image of Pentecost, of like flames descending, It's an image of the work of the Spirit. And Paul will write to Timothy that he should fan into flame the gift that he received through the laying on of hands. It's it's metaphorical language there, clearly. He's not getting out a blower, right? So what you've got here in quenching the Spirit isn't saying you can put the Spirit out, but it's clearly contrary to the will of the Spirit. And you ought to be keeping in step with the Spirit, not going contrary to the will of the Spirit. And I think the example then is treating prophecies with contempt, despising prophecy. Now, how's that different to saying this is not a prophecy? Well, it's to treat the prophecies with contempt is to dismiss the possibility. It's to rule it out altogether. It's to have no interest in it. And you can imagine if the Thessalonians are getting these prophecies saying, well, we've heard it from the Apostle Paul, or we've heard it from God, that the second coming has already happened. Um, Those who are mature in the congregation might say, no more prophecies. We're not going to have any of this stuff. And Paul says, no, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater here. You, You don't have to stop all prophecy, but you're on solid ground if you test them and hold on to what's good and reject what's evil. So how do you do that? How do you discern without despising? Well, likewise, down in 1 Corinthians 14, the others should weigh carefully what is said. I think it's the same idea to be considering carefully. Uh, Well, here's five suggestions for you for discerning prophecy. Um, I'd like to lay claim to these, but I got them from John Stott. Uh, in his little commentary on 1 Thessalonians. And I think they are a helpful set of questions and you might be able to come up with more. I don't think they're meant to be exhaustive. They're meant to show the different ways that we can weigh up prophecy. First of all, is it consistent with the Bible? So that in, what, in Acts 17, the Bereans, uh, they listened to the word of Paul when he came to Berea And they opened the scriptures and they worked out whether what Paul said was consistent with the Bible. I think that the whole nature of what we're dealing with here is to to emphasise the importance of God speaking through his prophetic word in the Bible. Therefore, weigh it up against God's prophetic word in the Bible. That's a good starting point. Um, God is not going to be 
uh, saying something contrary to what he's already said. Now, I've had people uh, sadly say that they have received a message from God that they should uh, do something. Well, actually, I'll, no, I'll just say what it is, that they should leave their wife and go and start a new relationship with somebody else. God had told them that. No, he hadn't, because God doesn't lie. And God doesn't change his mind like that. And the scriptures say that's not the case. So there might be a breakdown in relationship. There may be great sadness. There may be a whole bunch of things that have gone wrong. But God was not telling him that he should leave his wife and go and enter into the relationship with the person from his workplace. That was not the case. Because God doesn't lie. So you might like to work at whether it's consistent with the scriptures. Now, that won't cover everything. You might also like to ask the question, what does it say about Jesus? So, for example, we looked at these references already, so I won't go back over them. 1 John 4, um, it's the spirit that makes it clear that Jesus has come in the flesh. Now, in 1 John, I used to think that it was talking about come in the flesh as in the incarnation. I'm now persuaded that come in the flesh is speaking of the resurrection. Either way, if the teaching that comes or the prophecy that comes is denying the bodily resurrection of Jesus or his physical incarnation, then it's clearly false to be rejected. Would that ever happen? Yes. Somebody was asking me recently about the difference between Jehovah's Witnesses and Christians. Well, there's an example. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in the bodily resurrection. And sometimes people ask the question, well, what's the difference between Islam and Christianity? Islam only has one God, Allah, and, and we have one God, Yahweh. Well, here's an example. The Quran teaches that Jesus didn't die on the cross. There was a body double. Jesus was just taken up into heaven. So either the Bible or the Quran are false prophecy. Now, closer to home, we've had bishops in our own country saying, no, Jesus didn't rise from the dead but his memory continues and shapes us and influences us. There are examples of people claiming the truth and peddling lies. Secondly, or thirdly, does it accord with the gospel of grace? I think the harshest words that you will hear from the Apostle Paul, who is really quite gentle in so many ways, especially if you read 1 Thessalonians, is in the beginning of, of Galatians. Listen to this. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Verse 8. Verse 9. I'll interpret it. Read my lips, he says. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. There are some things that you go to the stake for. There are some hills that you die on. And the gospel of God's grace is one of them. Don't mess with that because it leads people to hell. That's why Paul's saying effectively, if they're going to preach a false gospel, let them go to hell. Because it matters. It wants people to be saved. Fourth, what fruit does the speaker show? The, the prophecy speaker. And um, we've looked at both these references as well. So Matthew, Jesus talks about by their fruit you will know them. 2 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 3. Listen to this. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them. 
and their destruction has not been sleeping. Some of you are familiar with um, Benny Hinn. Um, some of you are familiar with Costa Hinn. Costa is um, Benny Hinn's nephew. And uh, he's written a book calling out his... It's a very gracious book, very gentle book, but he's called out the false prophecy of his family. How they would declare messages over people that they could respond to by sending in money. And a message of God's blessing and providence that led a few to become filthy rich at the expense of those who couldn't even afford to give. And sadly, the state of the church in Africa has been that the prosperity gospel has done incredible damage amongst the abject poor. And it's obscene. By their fruit, you will recognise them. I mean, people will get things wrong. And the fruit might point in the wrong direction. So then you, you speak up and, and you call for repentance. And, and God willing, if you're dealing with someone who's engaged with the truth, they will repent and change and come back to Christ. But when the whole industry, and in many ways there are industries built on false prophecy, Keeps building this way. And this is one of the reasons why I, I think internet preachers, and I guess I'm one of them in a way, we put our, our talks up online, but um, t- to just have a diet of listening to your, your favourite people um, and, and hearing from them and, and having them teach you, you don't see their life. You don't know how they spend their time. You don't know the nature of their family relationships. I I think it's one of the reasons why God calls us into physical fellowship with each other. There's an accountability built in as we see each other's lives. And what's taught should be modelled. And we should encourage each other when that's a struggle. And then fifthly, is it encouraging and edifying? This is so important. Look, at, look at, at verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 14. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging and comfort. This is not a definition of prophecy, by the way. It's a description. You know the difference? Um, I'll get tangled if I try and explain the difference. <laughs> but he's saying that, that the purpose of prophecy not the defining of prophecy. The purpose of prophecy is that people are built up. The church grows. It's strengthened into maturity. And people are urged to keep on going. I wish sometimes people paused to consider whether what they were about to say was going to be edifying. You might have heard of this, but famous Christian preacher in the name of John Piper Uh, talks about how he received a prophecy from a woman at church um, and she had this message for him and she wrote it down and asked if she could share it with him. And the message was that his wife, who was pregnant with their fourth child, was going to die in childbirth, but they would have a daughter. He said he heard that prophecy He thanked the woman, he went home and he wept. They had a boy and his wife's still alive, I've met her. Think before you speak. Not only weigh up what people say, but weigh up before you say it would be the application in that context. I don't know what could have brought that about. See, the, the, the picture here, I think, is pretty simple. That is, don't dismiss prophecy, but test it. And hang on to what's good 
and run a mile from what's evil. And I think with that in mind, we have a recipe for responding to this passage. But before I come to that, there's a couple more things I want to say. First of all, look at verse 27 up in the box at the top. He's talked about not treating prophecies with contempt but testing them. Notice how he speaks about his own letter. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. He doesn't say, I want you to gather the people around and weigh up this letter. Test it. Hang on to the good. Reject the evil. Paul is conscious that he's speaking with the authority of God himself. Likewise, if you come down to 2 Thessalonians, having spoken about people being tossed around by prophecy, word of mouth or letter, asserting the day of the Lord has already come, in verse 15 of the same chapter he says, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings that we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Stand firm on our teaching, which we've handed on to you. Teaching from Jesus by the Spirit of God. And at the end of this letter, chapter 3, verse 14, take special note of anyone who does not obey the instructions in this letter. Don't associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Now, notice there that Paul is self-consciously writing with authority and that can only be the authority of God's spirit so how can we respond to this well let me say a couple of things I don't think we need to know whether we've got an accurate definition of prophecy to know how to respond in a godly way. If prophecy is a word from God and it claims to be from God, then we should be able to weigh that up, test it by scripture and by these other means and work out what to do with it. Um, and if it's from God and it's consistent, then we need to work out how to put it into practice, how to respond. If it turns out that it's not consistent with the scripture or it fails these other tests, then without being flippant about it, we need to respond that we aren't convinced that we need to do this and probably spell out why. Someone may say they have a word from God. They may say they have a prophecy. They might say, I really feel in my soul that this is what you should do. They might say, I had a, a dream last night and this is what it was about. They might open the Bible and preach a sermon. How do you respond? I think, test it. Hang on to what's good and reject every kind of evil. Don't believe me. Don't, don't believe Dave MacDonald. Believe God. And if Dave MacDonald has got it wrong, then help me to see how that's the case and let's work it getting it right together. So we can approach these words, wherever they come from, whatever they hold, whatever they're called, with confidence and with care. Now I realise I may have opened up more questions than I've resolved. That's okay. That's, that's okay. And I've deliberately gone on for a long time, so there's not much time for questions. Um, but I did say I'd take some, so I will do that. And Nathan, I might just get you to give the heads up to the kids that we might just be a few more minutes.